and um, a bit easy to be him to. Um, Okay, so um, I'm interested in these transformation debates that are going on at the moment. Um, and what I want to do um, today is to think about this word transformation and what it means from a teaching point of view. Now we live in really interesting times. On, on the 9th of March, um, a student at UCT threw a bucket of shit over the Rhodes Memorial statue on UCT campus. And what but was taken by a certain sector of uh, South African society as a simple act of hooliganism has sparked something like a popular insurrection. Um, and this is, this is also really interesting to me, is how this, this single event um, uh, has suddenly exploded, particularly because of the, the, the presence of social media and has become a massive movement on Facebook and Twitter and is now um, that uh, expanded to the point um, where Rhodes uh, University is undergoing a sort of fundamental set of debates around the name of the university where the King George V statue at uh, Howard College was just covered in white paint this okay. week um, and that there's a, there's a very high level um, of debate happening um, and this debate is interesting because of the, ex the, the range of the participation. I mean, there's thousands of people who are actively participating online in the debates, and there's a wide range of opinions. And, and although some of them are on the kind of level of idiocy of YouTube comments, um, a lot of the stuff is really, really thoughtful, analytic stuff coming from young South African students uh, who are trying to understand their place in the world and the, the whole idea of social change. Um, interestingly enough, one of the things that's been glossed over is the particular individual who triggered this, um, uh, this sort of phase of critical engagement is the same student who was abducted and beaten by uh, Zuma's thugs for mm -hmm. flipping him the bird when he was driving past in his cavalcade. Do you remember that incident? Yeah. Um, which is really interesting, uh, and one of the reasons it's interesting is because a lot of the bad side of this debate has been a racial polarization of like, oh, this is like white students feeling threatened by black students. And it's clear that, 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 that from, the, from, from, from the political range of his critique, that the originator of this is actually interested in structural issues that, that actually are not simply reducible to racial politics in South Africa. The other interesting thing is that most South Africans on, haven't been keeping up with the fact that there's massive protests happening internationally. As we speak, various top universities uh, in the West are currently being occupied by students. The University of Amsterdam, the London School of Economics um, are, are, are currently in kind of a crisis of, of students literally shutting down their universities. Um, there's a big critical move uh, in Canada at the moment. You know, Canada is usually sort of notorious for its uh, um, lack of conflict. Um, but there's several universities there that are, that are currently in, engaged in, in, in the sort of moment of student uprising. Um, and there's a general pervasive sense in the United States and in Australia as well that there's a, there's a, there's a kind of moment of critical confrontation happening in the academy. Um, now, what's interesting is the South African debates are being framed primarily around race and colonialism and, uh, and uh, 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 particularly around the sort of triggering figure of Cecil John Rhodes and these two um, narratives of him, the one, uh, the sort of uh, the, the pro-colonial narrative of him as this hero who established uh, so many, so much of South Africa's infrastructure and economic development, and the other, a kind of a decolonial narrative of him as a, as really a kind of a genocidal psychopath who has done untold harm to the people of South Africa, and that many of our current problems of, of race, underdevelopment, poverty are really traceable back to his kind of lunatic um, colonial um, mania. Um, so what we need to do is to look more carefully at the, at, at, at the differences between those debates and how they both are linked to notions of transformation because in an interesting sense the South African debates articulate themselves as being pro-transformation whereas the, the, the Western debates are actually opposing a kind of transformation that they see having happened in the last 
uh, 30 years or so. Um, so when people talk about, about transformation in education in South Africa, they're generally talking about demographic transformation, first of all. Okay? They are um, they, they arguing against the apartheid structure of education in South Africa that really made education a system for maintaining racial elites. Um, and the context in which those debates are happening are these very, very high levels of poverty and unemployment that exist in South Africa. And saying, so what does it mean to transform education in South Africa away from that racist, elitist legacy towards something new? Um, and it plugs into national discourses of transformation, which, which, which tend to be much broader. Um, and, the, and, and include many different elements, elements of transformation towards democracy, towards equality, towards human rights, dignity, universal quality of life. Um, and that tends to be a quite a, a broader definition that is, than that is the one that is being applied um, within higher education debates. Um, when we think about that, we also need to think about the, the kinds of exclusion that are still happening in South Africa. Uh, uh, the African um, higher education, that, it, that if, if it still is maintaining this apartheid colonial structure, which the, um, the um, uh, roads must fall and black students movements uh, on social media are claiming it is, um, the, the interesting thing that's happening in those debates is that the, the processes by which that exclusion is happening are being really clearly articulated, probably for the first time. The formal exclusion um, has, is, has a kind of a long-standing history. Um, this idea of, um, of, of certain candidates being preferred on the basis of, um, uh, of, of race. Um, but the other kind of exclusion that's being talked about, particularly around the Twitter handle Road So White, which is really worth following, um, is around the informal exclusion and the way in which, despite uh, sort of formal criteria that are supposed to be inclusive, many universities still make um, students socially and culturally uncomfortable because the kind of dominant social norms and practices of the university are profoundly alienating to many of the students who are trying to study there. And this more subtle articulation of exclusion is something that's really undergoing a quite a kind of vigorous articulation, which I think people should be following closely at the moment. I think there's something very exciting happening there. Um, the other factor that needs to be looked at is the, is, is the way in which universities perpetuate underlying um, forms of structural exclusion, particularly the fact that students arriving for selection into university have already undergone uh, systems of differentiation into structural equality. There's already differential systems of primary and secondary education that are advantaging certain students and others. There are already linguistic systems of inequality where certain languages are privileged languages of academic study and assessment. And there's economic marginalization in the sense that, that, that certain groups of people can pay to get to university and others can't. Um, and all of those structural axes need to be added to, to, to the sort of narrow thinking around um, sort of formal institutional exclusion. One of the debates that, 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 that is sort of taken off at UCT is a result of um, an accusation that, that also became a kind of a social media meme that UCT really doesn't have many um, black African, South African lecturers at all. Um, the numbers that have been uh, thrown around is six at the moment, which is a, a truly shocking statistic. But it's interesting the way it's being constructed. But more than that, what was interesting is Grasa Michel, who's the Chancellor of UCT's response to that, which is saying that the, that the race of the, of the instructors at the university is far less important than the race of the students. Okay, that, that, that inclusiveness should be happening at the level of student education, not at the level necessarily of the skin color of those giving the lectures. Um, and this has been hotly contested and, and once again a very nuanced version of why this thinking may be wrong and what it means for um, young intellectuals to, to not be educated by people who they recognize as being kind of culturally familiar and coming from similar social backgrounds is really crucial. Um, alongside that is, is another set of, of, of critiques around the racialization of, of um, 
notions of transformation and this idea that we shouldn't think exclusively about race but we should think also primarily about class and the fact that even within the sort of elite institutions like UCT um, the black students who are attending those institutions are kind of model C middle class students they're, they're still um, underneath race there's still a class differentiation based on the structural economic um, problems of poverty in South Africa, but that there are also other issues like language, like the fact of English being the dominant uh, medium of instruction and assessment, issues around um, um, ethnicity, nationality, religion, other forms of culture, um, that, that, that all play into this sense of who is able to uh, a, a, a attend elite um, higher education institutions and who is made to feel welcome and, and an active participant in those institutions. So, so this is really a, a, a very complex set of debates. At the same time, the, sort of, the Western debates are, are being fought on a very different set of terms at the moment which are, are, are about uh, what I'm calling a, a neoliberal transition, something that started in the 1980s, particularly under the Thatcher government in the, the UK, which is the transformation of education from it being a public resource, something that, that taxpayers paid for, that the state implemented in order to, to enhance the well-being of the society as a totality, towards um, education as being a personal career advantage and a shift away from the university as a public good to a kind of a managerialism, um, a corporate notion of what the university is, a, a market orientation, there, and the importance of branding and ranking in the in university self-concept. Um, and this seems to be a, a, a really interesting transformation that is happening because it's happening in South Africa as well, but no one's identifying it as a transformation and no one's calling it a transformation. There tends to be a kind of a silence around this, this, this corporatization of the university in South Africa and what it means in terms of other notions of transformation. So I think we need to be very careful to foreground what's going on here and talk about what it means. And to talk about the way in which this new model of the university actually stabilizes forms of inequality. This idea of the university as a, a brand that is about itself um, actually uh, d doesn't help participate in social change. What it, what it helps is it, 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 it becomes a vehicle of social stratification. It becomes a thing of the people who are already privileged enough to get in uh, uh, become ensured that they will continue to occupy privileged positions in society and the people who can't are, 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 are allocated to, to continued underprivileged positions in the society. Um, in this view Okay, the, the value of the university for individual students is in helping them negotiate a, a, a system of, of economic inequality. Okay, so essentially the reason you attend university is to, in order to facilitate in your, your a guaranteed place in, in, in the socio-economic middle class of South Africa. Um, and um, once people, once that becomes a view of, 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 of the proper role of the university, um, the university um, becomes an intrinsically elitist uh, institution that really maintains class differences in South Africa. Now, there's a, there's a particular neoliberal mythology that tries to fudge this, which is the idea that um, what needs, what, how, how society develops is that everyone gets educated, that, that, that um, more and more people get educated and by becoming more and more educated, they all then be, be, are able to raise their, their standard of living until everyone miraculously becomes middle class and you have this kind of end of history utopian middle class society. And of course the critique of that sort of has a long history going right back to Marx showing that, that the, 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 the sort of economic functioning of the kind of society we live in depends absolutely on economic inequality for the simple reason that that cheap labor is is is, is a, a, an indispensable resource to the kind of um, wealth uh, generation for the elites that we see happening and uh, unless we can conceptualize that critique which I'm not going to articulate for you today I, if you haven't if you're not up on that critique you need to go off and get up on it in a big hurry 
um, because that really um, throws the what, 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 what is what is fundamentally dishonest about the neoliberal version of universities um, into relief. Um, so what what goes on in this sort of neoliberal transformation? Okay. Uh, the, the, the big change we've seen uh, in many Western countries is a shift away from kind of state-funded education to privately funded education. That the, the shift away from education being a free um, resource to being something that people have to personally invest in. And the critical word there is invest. Um, they, they take out student loans, they borrow money on the understanding that that investment will re re lead to financial returns, that it will lead to an increased income and, will be, and, and the, reward of, the economic reward of that will be multiplied many times over. Um, at the same time, something happens in the very, the very character of, of higher education in, in institutions themselves. As they stop being about the public good, and uh, they also stop being about participatory uh, decision-making within their own managerial structures, within their own systems of, of governance and, and decision-making, and start uh, gradually migrating towards a kind of authoritarian uh, managerialism. And those of you who haven't read um, Chetty and Merritt's book on UKZN, The Battle for the Soul of South African University, this is essential reading. I mean, this is a pivotal text in understanding the way a major university in South Africa was, was shifted from being a kind of democratic in, uh, education institution into a managerial um, corporate that existed um, for the prestige and, and career advancement of a set of elites. Um, so what starts going on here is that the, the, the primary interest of this new kind of management is not the quality of the public education that the institution is offering. They start becoming interested in the brand of the university, okay? Um, and so public relations and rankings start becoming priority projects of the university. And, and suddenly decisions start being made in reference to the system of, the sort of international system of university rankings. Are we number 400 or number 300 in the, in, 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 in the, in the various international systems of, of ranking the prestige of universities? And this depends on things like the number of publications per staff member, the number of PhDs produced. Um, and there's almost no space for measuring uh, the, the, quali the quality of the education offered to ordinary undergraduate students within that system. That's not seen as really a pivotal axis for ranking. <coughs> Nor are um, other values such as the social goods produced by the university. Um, so, that, so, so, so there's a kind of a slippage here in which the entire character of the university changes completely. And what's interesting about this is this happens without debate. This is not a kind of transformation that is debated. This is something that just gets slipped in surreptitiously while no one is really noticing it. It happens gradually. It happens without a defense. It just becomes a kind of common sense that we should now do things like that, that we should be now hiring more people, doing public relations, doing management. We should now be, be rewarding publication and PhDs and not really getting too worried about what the average first year or second year student is, is, is getting in terms of, of, of their, their university experience. Um, and so we have this, the, 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 this shift away from teaching and towards these other sort of uh, what, what then become normalized measures of excellence is like research and publications and big fundraising, kind of big do donations for infrastructure and for research. Um, and all of this happens kind of quietly um, and uh, people only realize that it's happened when it's too late and they suddenly find themselves in an institution that is nothing like what they intended to be part of. And once again, I refer you to Chetty and Merritt's book on, on UKZN as an exemplary case study um, of, this, of this kind of transformation. So, sorry, what is the title of the book? Chetty? I think it's called The Battle for the Soul of a South African University. And you, it, uh, you can download the PDF for free from their site, or you can buy the book for 200 Rand from um, uh, uh, Adams and, and other local bookshops. And for those of you who don't know, um, Chetty was one of the members of Senate that, yes. uh, that w with Vandenberg that 
attempted early on to criticize the emergence of a culture of authoritarianism within university management and for that got uh, uh, sort of uh, excommunicated from the university, I think is the most appropriate word. Um, okay, so, uh, given that ugly picture, what's the other version of the university that is being, that, that, that these, these people in Amsterdam and LSE are, are trying to assert and that has been long, a uh, long-standing element in the notion of education, particularly the notion of a liberal education, okay? Um, and the crucial thing to start thinking about then is, is in what way is a university different from other kinds of institutions, particularly other kinds of, 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 of corp corporations and profiteering institutions? In what way isn't a university a, 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 a corporation or a brand? and to really carefully start defining that. Um, and one of the things that, that the sort of liberal tradition of education has always asserted is that the university is a kind of unique space for challenging things that go on in the society, for challenging um, forms of inequality, for asserting new forms of engagement. And generally the sort of underlying framework is that that they, 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 they're two sort of major modes of social engagement. The one is, is authoritarian, force-based um, social organization, a kind of dictatorship of various kinds. And the other is a democratic system which values participation, which varies, values inclusiveness, which values debate, which values kind of rationality and consensus as ways of achieving social values, okay? Um, and that universities are, are uniquely good spaces for, um, for developing those kind of skills and those kinds of ways of, reaction, uh, of interaction, uh, especially within the social sciences, but not only. Within science itself, there's a kind of a fundamentally democratic principle that the very notion of science is a move away from traditional means of of, of asserting knowledge, which have been like um, primarily political and, and, and theological, that, that, that certain accounts of the world and how it works are asserted because of religion or because of who's in power. Um, and science is, is, is fundamentally democratic in that, it, in that anyone can participate in generating scientific knowledge, but also that the terms of, of evaluation of scientific knowledge are, are democratic, that you have to be able to show how you arrived at a certain understanding and convince other people um, that there are, there, there, there are good reasons for them to consent to that, um, rather than simply saying, claiming that you know, this is the decree of the king or the word of God um, as a way of arriving at knowledge. Um, the other thing that really interests me is the kind of way in which university, the liberal university is seen as a sort of a, a model society, and I want to talk about that on another day. Um, in the sense that it becomes a space that experiments with a better version of people existing together, a better version of achieving understandings, better version of, 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 of actually um, being social people in a, in a, in, in a, in a social world. And, that these, these, the, and this depends on these kind of fundamental rules of engagement, the, 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 the equality given to people to, um, to learn and produce knowledge, um, the, con the, 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 the sort of consensual rules of agreeing on knowledge, um, and also that the strong tradition within the liberal university that we, that we saw really interestingly debated recently when the SRC um, launched this anti-Semitic attack and said that Jewish students must be deregistered. And this kind of sent shockwaves through the university for a very specific reason. It's not just that that is a unconstitutional and a hate crime. It's that to, 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 um, to try and propose that kind of discrimination is antithetical to the core of what a liberal university is. Mm -hmm. It actually attacks the very notion that prejudice, discrimination, inequality, um, violence as a means of resolving conflict, that, 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 that these are not what the, a university does. A university does things in a different way that is fundamentally better and fundamentally more deeply linked to the project of um, creating ways of having a democratic society. Um, 
Now, when we start thinking about that, we get to the title of this talk, that subtitle of the university as, an, as a site and weapon of struggle. And those of you who are kind of 1980s lefties will be familiar with that phrase. This is, I mean, the phrase that was hotly contested at the time is, is culture a site of struggle or a weapon of struggle? It was a really interesting debate that was happening in the, in the social left um, during the 1980s. And what it meant was, is, is culture a weapon of struggle in that should sort of political groups use culture to advance their own particular goals. So, so it's in a Marxist terms kind of vanguardist view of culture, saying, okay, well, we know what the people need and we will articulate cultural forms that will drag them to that destination. Or is there another view of culture which says that culture is this kind of radical democratic space where people can start articulating their own aspirations to freedom, to equality, to democracy, to their, to, to their specific identities and, 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 and social aspirations. So, so should culture serve a political goal or should culture create the collective political aspirations of the country? Um, and the one was a kind of a the, the sort of authoritarian view um, of culture as a, as, a, as a tool of predefined political goals, and the other was a kind of a laissez-faire view of culture as a, a, as a space for generating um, the sort of ideas and ways of interacting that might then help create um, a model for future society. Um, and I'm really trying to, to, to think about that, to think about moving away from the university as a weapon of struggle, which most of the South African transformation debates have assumed is the, the way it should be thought about, and instead to look at the universities as a site of struggle, universities as a, a kind of unique space where certain kind of social issues can be negotiated and resolved, and what it would mean for them to be able to do that. Um, what's the time? Okay, this is going to go on for a bit, so bear with me. Okay, so, okay, that's the introduction. <laughs> the real interesting part is, uh, for me, is what it means to be a lecturer in terms of when I understand myself being an academic, I understand myself being a teacher, as a person who develops courses, and goes and stands in front of students and starts getting them to think new thoughts and interact with them and change who they are, how they live in the world, how they understand what's going on. But it seems to me in the neoliberal transformation of the university that is increasingly being kind of uh, emptied out as being a core function. So I want to reassert <coughs> this, the, the idea that teaching as a site of struggle is a core aspect of transformation in the university. And I want to talk in very specific terms, go away from all this kind of theory, to talk about that, my actual teaching practice. And to focus on something that I developed over several years, which was a completely new curriculum area that hadn't existed at all, um, that linked questions of violence in South Africa um, to questions of inequality in South Africa and to think about the way in which the, 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 the kind of obsessions with crime and violence, um, the, of sort of crime reporting, fear of crime, uh, neighborhood watches, um, all of these kinds of things, how these are, of, of, are things that are structuring South African society at the moment, and that, um, that, that academics are not really inquiring into that deeply enough, um, uh, in my view. So, so I started saying, well, what if we, what if we turned this into a, a, into a core area of inquiry? What, what, what would start going on? Um, and one of the things I wanted to do is not to take a, a criminological view of crime, not to say, well, we want to understand the causes of crime and violence in South Africa and then, uh, and, 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 and then implement the solutions. I wanted to say, well, how do we understand and communicate these things? How do journalists write about them? How do people have dinner table conversations about them? And what kind of world does that, all that communication create? Okay, and one of the things that immediately became obvious in looking at this is that the, the sort of fear of crime and violence is a fundamental lever that is being used to reverse human rights in South Africa, that is being, being used to re-establish 
uh, segregation and inequality and racism in South Africa. Um, the kind of the fortification of the suburbs, the fear of young black men, um, all of these things are being are, are, are happening through these kind of discourses of crime and violence. And it seems to me this is this is very serious. The other thing that it's serving to do is to attack a kind of a liberal view of society where uh, social problems are things that are dealt with by being understood and by transformation and to reassert um, the management of social um, problems through what under the apartheid era, uh, era was called krachtdadigheid. In other words, just the brute force. Okay, so if we're scared of crime and violence, what we need is brute force. We need the police to shoot criminals. We need to bring back the death penalty. We need to castrate rapists. All these kinds of, of discourses. These are fundamentally, fundamental attacks on, 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 on democracy and an attempt to replace a kind of a democratic, rational, problem-solving society with a society that just re, re, um, re, resorts to dictatorial brute force to control its citizens. Um, but it's not seen as that. It's seen as uh, somehow as a kind of a rational way of dealing with an urgent problem. And, and this really concerns me. So, so I wanted to, to, to kind of really think about this in a, in a, in a deep and worried kind of way. Um, and in doing that, um, one of the things that um, I wanted to do in, in, in teaching these things is not teach them in the sense of, okay, here's what we know. Okay, here's a, a, a prepackaged bundle. I mean, that's part of the teaching experience, is, 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 is giving people really interesting pieces of information that, that are quite striking. Like, for instance, the fact that, that murder in South Africa has systematically and, and dramatically dropped over the last 20 years. I mean, it's, 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 it's almost a historically unheard of reduction in, 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 in homicide in South Africa between 1994 and today. And when you say that to people, they kind of just don't know what to do because that's so against mm. the nonsense that makes up the common sense with which they experience the world, that, 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 that it becomes almost unmanageable information. So yes, we, we have information like that. We, have, we bring in social theories, but we try and understand what that means and what it means for people to be thinking, what it means for them to be to be understanding their lives, to be deciding whether to spend money on having armed response or to spend money on educating their children, to decide what kind of articles they're going to write if they're journalists, to decide um, what political parties they're going to vote for, um, for, the, for, the, for the president to decide who he's going to make minister of police depending you know, whether this is a guy who's going to say bring back the death penalty or whether this is a person who's going to say we need to transform our prisons towards rehabilitation. The latter is just not politically sellable at the moment. So you have these like, uh, you, you have politicians saying, oh, we must, and they did it two years ago, introduced these new laws that in South Africa, the police are allowed to kill you just because they think you might commit a violent crime. That's now legal in South Africa. Um, it's astonishing. I mean, it's a massive reversal of the of the constitution of the country. Um, um, so, what we're really trying to teach uh, by by covering this thing is the ability to think critically, firstly about society and the social world and the understandings that make up that social world, but secondly and most importantly how our thinking makes us certain kinds of people, how it gives us feelings, anxieties, hopes, aspirations, anger, frustration, and, 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 and changes the way in which we, we inter interact with each other. So the teaching process then shifts from me as an expert uh, unloading information into the heads of ignorant students and becomes a kind of a participatory, participatory process which starts saying, well, what problems are students dealing with? What are they worrying about when they are getting public transport home? Um, what problems are they worrying about um, when they are living in res on campus? Uh, and to really start exploring these sort of personal narratives of crime and violence as being profound parts um, of society and individual identities. Um, and then to, to, to make the core... Um, uh, um, goal of teaching 
the ability to critic, to become aware of and critically reflect on, on these kinds of processes and understandings that are circulating around us. Um, and to then add to that the ability to engage in formal academic analysis and research to, 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 to think about those things. And to introduce into that a kind of a level of critical theoretical thinking that then enables people to start saying, well, okay, well, what are the social functions of these discourses? What is the ideological function of, for instance, fear of crime as it is articulated in terms of hijackers, uh, uh, um, uh, burglars, things like that? Like, what does it do to maintain a certain organization of society and who does it keep in power and who does it keep excluding from that society? So, it's, and essentially, the, the course becomes a, about this really interesting statement, which we, we get deeper and deeper the more you think about it, which is don't believe everything you think. becomes a challenge to the kind of normalization of common sense and say that, that, if, that if a kind of a liberal approach to teaching can do something, it can make you question yourself and become something new and different. And it can make you participate in society differently and, and make that society something new and different. And so that's what I'm trying to put back on the table as a core part of the, of the teaching process. Okay? So some specific things that we were doing in these courses is moving away from, from this, kind of, uh, this kind of almost theological way of demonizing violent offenses. The, you know, this notion that these are people who are evil and must be damned to hell now rather than as being people who, who, who exist in certain social situations and for various reasons end up making certain choices, being involved in certain kinds of activities and, and, and coming to grips with that. Um, and moving from the kind of intuitive way of engaging this topic, which is a fear of being a victim of violence, towards a kind of conceptual understanding of structural violence in society. And the notion of structural violence is key here. Essentially, structural violence talks about the fact that violence isn't only physical acts that people do to each other. It isn't just shooting someone or punching in the face. Structural violence is changing someone's quality of life. Structural violence is, is children dying of malnutrition. Structural violence is certain social groups having less life expectancy because they, their nutrition and health care is not as good as other social groups. Structural violence is certain groups being more likely to be murdered than others because of the social situation they find themselves. So all of those elements. Um, so um, sort of creating a critical understanding of it. The other really core cool part of this is understanding the way in which people actually come to accept and, 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 and endorse and promote violence uh, in every aspect of their everyday lives, to promote violence in child rearing, to say, oh no, you need to hit your kids because that will make them better citizens in some way. To say, oh no, you need to, you need to slap your wife when she's cheeky to you. <laughs> to say, oh, we need to castrate all rapists. To say we need to bring back the death penalty. These are all of, of fundamental forms of violence, which, which unlike our, 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 our um, demonization of so-called criminals, that we say, no, that this good and, and normal and right-thinking people should support these kinds of violence. And to, to really problematize that and to show what work that does in, in the world we're living in. Um, and then to develop a kind of a coherent uh, uh, sort of um, theoretical understanding of, of how these processes are working and being reproduced. Um, but most of all, to get to this question of how this kind of teaching then shifts who people are, that shifts how people relate to their romantic partners, how they, re um, they um, treat their kids, how they interact with members of different social groups on the street um, and, and in a sense to, 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 to think about how that then creates a different kind of world for us all to live in. Okay, So to conclude then, by thinking about the outcomes, and I put the word outcomes in brackets because of, because of my kind of uh, uh, horror of this technocratic managerial jargon. And outcomes is a beloved word of of kind of quality promotion and Department of Education people who don't really want to think about what's really going on and instead just plug things into 
um, a set of formulas. So, so if we have to talk about outcomes, um, and actually it's more sophisticated than that. I mean, people talk about kind of, within pedagogical thinking, they talk about kind of soft outcomes and hard outcomes, and, and it's actually a bit more nuanced than I'm making it out to be. But, okay, what, 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 what I really want to be able to do as an academic, as a teacher, as a person involved in transformation through higher education teaching is to produce expertise in social pro so problem solving, to produce um, critical thinking, especially critical reflexivity, in other words, especially the ability to properly understand who we are, to understand our histories and our identities in the ways that the dominant accounts in society have not properly articulated for us. And to look at the process of education not simply as a process of job skilling, which the kind of neoliberal model does, not simply as a, a, a process of saying, well, if I give you these skills, you'll be able to get that job and you'll get this salary and your social problems will be over because your paycheck will make everything good. Um, and instead, to really consider the aspects of personal transformation, um, of changing what kind of person we are, to facilitate a transformation into a kind of democratic citizen, someone who understands themselves, who respects other people, who, who, who interacts in supportive, rational, problem-solving ways, rather than simply using kind of force um, to, 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 to um, resolve conflicts, um, and thus to produce a kind of generation of democratic citizens. And so I've, I've, I've sort of summarized the, 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 the point of this work in saying that these possibilities identify features of the university which should be explicitly articulated in transformation debates, if not made the very core of the definition of transformation. Now you can see that by the time I'm saying this, this is very different from saying transformation is about the demographic composition of the student and lecturer body within higher education institutions. It's, it's, it includes that, but it really has broadened it very, very far into a, something that has much more radical scope and, and that reintroducing teaching as a core activity of what we do in higher education. This implies not just transformation in access and throughput, but the university as a unique site of transformation of the entire society. And that's really what I want to leave you with today, is th this notion that, that higher education teaching is also about transforming not just who occupies what socio-economic positions in the society, but that fundamentally changes the structure of that society, the forms of inequality, the forms of coexistence that exist. And, and, and thus the university becomes a kind of utopian space that, that is a kind of a, a precursor to the production of a democratic society. Thanks.